Hello, and thank you for having me. Thanks to SEA, and thanks for listening to me. Um, so my daily life in a cupping room is half the endless summer and half Sherlock Holmes. I'm constantly searching for the next great flavor experience, and when I find it, I'm searching for how to get it again. Uh, I'm a curious guy, which is why I'm up here. It didn't take me too many instances of having a nice arrival drop off by four cupping points just after two months before I started looking into the causes of what's happening. Now, the specialty coffee industry has done a great job of adopting moisture content as an indicator, even going so far as data logging shipping containers during transit, all in an effort to understand what's keeping our coffee from performing at its best. But a missing puzzle piece due to lack of research and education has been water activity, which is the state of energy of water in our coffee. Combining the more commonly understood moisture content with water activity can tell us more than we already know about our coffee. Green coffee will take on and give up moisture to stabilize to its environment, and water activity can help us predict how, coffee that how quickly the coffee will stabilize. Now, I hope I can explain to you in this presentation why water activity is so important for green coffee. Uh, as we're in the early stages of adopting water activity as an indicator, we don't yet know everything that we can do with it. What we do know is that there are immediate impacts that can be made to mitigate risks on our supply chains. Now, potato chips and strawberries are delicious, though that has nothing to do with water activity. But we can use these two delicious things as an example of understanding the water activity of different substances. So let's imagine we're going on a picnic, and for some reason we packed up a bag with loose potato chips and strawberries in it. Uh, they both have moisture content but the rate at which the moisture content transfers in and out of these substances is different. Chips, as we know, will take on moisture quickly. Strawberries take a very long time to dry out. It's safe to say that when you get to your picnic, you're going to be unhappy with your soggy chips, though your strawberries will be just fine. It's also interesting because this is an example of a high moisture content item like a strawberry that doesn't want to give up its moisture, another key point of water activity. Now, water activity is the state of energy of water in a substance. Our substance is green coffee. To calculate this, you need to know the vapor pressure. So you have to find the vapor pressure created by green coffee in a closed container. You take that vapor pressure, divide it by the vapor pressure of pure water, you have water activity. It's a measurement between zero and one. One being very high energy water, that's very loosely bound, zero, being very low energy water that's very tightly bound. Uh, I'm going to repeat a lot of these things over and over because they're new concepts for some of you. So I'll say it again. Water activity, state of energy of water in our coffee. If we think about it from the perspective of the bean instead of the water, which is most of our jobs, it's how tightly that bean holds on to its water. One being a very tight uh, one being a very loose bind, zero being a very tight bind on your water. We know that the tighter bound water is in our coffee, the more stable our coffee is, and that's an important thing. So water activity meters can be a bit deceptive. Even though they cost a lot of money, they can be pretty simple. You scoop up some coffee into a dish, put it in the machine, three to five minutes later, you have a number staring back at you. What, is the water meter, what does that number mean from the water activity meter? So let's use an example. Average coffee water activity of 0.6, because water activity is a unitless number between zero and one. What this means is that the water inside of our coffee is 60% as mobile as pure water. And we know that, say, coffee has 10% moisture, 60% is mobile as pure water. It may seem insignificant, but anytime you put green coffee into a container, be it a plastic bag for a sample or a container for shipment, there's going to be water vapor created, and that's what's measured by a water activity meter. Now, in 2015, one of my dreams came true. Sports and chemistry collided uh, for deflate gate. As you guys might remember, this surrounded the balls used by the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Um, and ball pressure and vapor pressure aren't the same thing, but they're 
governed by the same law. So what happened was the Patriots provided underfilled balls, which then dropped further below the approved pressure standard because they were used on a cold day. And this is one of the important similarities between ball pressure and vapor pressure. So this unusually underfilled pressure gave the Patriots an unfair advantage. They were fined $1 million. Hopefully we don't get one and find $1 million for our coffee. But the law that governs this is called the ideal gas law. What it tells us is that pressure equals the amount of gas in moles times the universal gas constant times the temperature of gas divided by the volume of the gas. If you were lucky in school, you had a fun mnemonic to remember this equation, which reads PV equals NRT. Now, it's a bit complicated. We don't need to know all that. If we remove some constants and simplify the equation, we can simply evaluate pressure equals the amount of gas in moles times the temperature of the gas. To visualize this, think about the amount of vapor created by room temperature water versus boiling water. We know that pressure is directly related to temperature. So the more temperature in the boiling water, we create, we create more water vapor and more pressure. Now, we deal with coffee and not water, so let's think about room temperature coffee versus coffee sitting in a shipping container after three weeks of transshipment. Which of these has higher vapor pressure? And just a hint, it's the coffee sitting in Cartagena. Because as I mentioned, green coffee, average water activity about 0.6. After that coffee sitting in a hot container, we're gonna have water activity closer to one. This is because of the ideal gas law. Higher temperature equals higher pressure equals higher water activity. And this is not a good thing for our coffee. Now, thanks for sticking with me through the theory behind water activity. Now I can finally get to the point of the talk of why water activity is important for green coffee. So, some of you have bought green coffee before. If you haven't, it doesn't always go as planned. I've had containers arrive moldy, which had to be rejected and caused significant problems for everyone in the supply chain. And can these problems be avoided? Who shoulders the costs in them and why should we have these problems at all? Uh, a government forced recall, which in the US would be initiated by the FDA, can be extremely financially damaging for a company, even putting people out of business. So it's in our best interest to avoid one of these situations. Uh, fungal growth in or on our coffee, think about molds, can cause harmful toxins to grow. The most concerning of which for green coffee are a family of fungal biotoxins, also known as mycotoxins. These mycotoxins have the same negative physical effects on people as heavy metals and pesticides. They're also responsible for countless product recalls and customers' rejections in a wide range of products, from juices to pasta to peanuts. Now, as it turns out, the US is a bit behind the times on mycotoxin regulations. The European Union and island nations, such as Australia and Japan, are notoriously strict on consumer regulations. And there's a lot that we can learn from them. Let's look at perhaps the most well-known mycotoxin for green coffee, which is ochratoxin A or OTA. Uh, the European Union has an OTA regulation of roasted coffee having no more than five parts per billion of OTA. To understand this for green coffee, we have to know what roasting does to OTA. So in 2005, the International Coffee Organization created an OTA risk management guideline. In doing this, they surveyed the existing scientific research and found that roasting has a range of reduction of OTA from 69 to 96%. That's a big range. It's not particularly safe, but I'm going to play it safe. Use the smallest amount of reduction, 69%. What this tells us is that our green coffee should have no more than 7 to 10 parts per billion of OTA to fall within this roasted coffee guideline. Now, I hope I'm not giving you a heart attack about toxins. I'm simply here trying to explain why it's important for us to be proactive about this issue instead of reactive. We don't want to get into a situation where we're getting a recall because we're not in control of what's happening. Uh, in 2011, President Obama signed into law the most sweeping food safety reform of the last 70 years in the US in the Food Safety Modernization Act, or colloquially FISMA, which you're going to hear more about in the next talk from Brian. 
By the end of 2018, even small companies will be required to comply with the laws of FISMA. All food facilities will have to establish and implement a food safety program to ensure that they're selling a safe food product. Oh. I hope I've done such a great job explaining water activity in my 10 minutes that you're going to go out and buy a water activity meter. You might be wondering, do I also have to go out and buy okra toxin A testing equipment? The answer is probably no. What you need to do to satisfy FISMA is create a system of robust, good manufacturing practices that include a green coffee purchasing program that'll satisfy these laws. Um, it's important to remember that as cuppers, we can taste and smell molds on the cupping table. But not all molds have mycotoxins, and not all OTA can be tasteable. No matter how good of a cupper you are, our tongue isn't our best sense of toxin detection. So part of a strong green coffee purchasing program can be setting up a water activity limit for your green coffee purchasing to prevent toxins. And if you don't want to measure OTA yourself, it can be very effective to set up periodic sampling with a certified third-party lab to measure the okra toxin for you. And if we think back to our room temperature green coffee and our hot green coffee sitting in a shipping container, we can think about a quality as opposed to a regulatory risk that can be aided by water activity measurement, because not everything's about being scared of toxins. So through multiple iterations of data logging shipping containers, we know that during shipping, fluctuations in temperature and humidity are unavoidable. Green coffee, when that temperature and humidity fluctuates, will change its moisture content to stabilize the environment of the container. What water activity tells us is that coffee with a higher water, water activity goes through more cycles of fluctuation than coffee with low water activity. These cycles cause a degradation in flavor and overall quality, which is not what we want. As opposed to the salespeople who are excited about increasing sales, nobody wants increasing water activity. We want stability for our green coffee. As an industry, we've tried multiple things to mitigate these fluctuations during shipment. We've tried cardboard container liners, desiccant bags, alternative packagings to jute. But can something be done even before shipment to mitigate these risks? There are technologically advanced mills already using water activity measurement to their advantage. And there's a certification program coming out from CQI soon for processing, which will focus on this as well. This is not yet the norm. This is a new idea for a lot of people, but hopefully in the future this will be. One of the big misunderstandings about water activity is why we need to measure both moisture content and water activity. The answer is that their relationship follows a moisture sorption isotherm. Now, what this isotherm means is that at one given moisture content, your coffee can have multiple water activity readings. So the coffee goes through multiple cycles of taking on and giving up moisture, which is following that isotherm curve. Depending on whether your coffee is taking on or giving up moisture, which is adsorption or desorption, you're going to be at a different point on that curve. So even though on the y-axis you have one water content, moisture content, on the x-axis you have a different water activity level. The fact that our coffee goes through multiple cycles on this isotherm is why you can have a great pre-shipment and a very lackluster arrival. So we can see with all this that looking at moisture content alone is deceptive and doesn't tell us everything. But pairing together water activity and moisture content tells us more than we can already see about our green coffee and can be beneficial for us in the future. Now, when I finally understood some of the risks about why coffee degrades during shipment and storage, I was only mildly satisfied. We still have to do something about it. This problem's multifaceted and requires a complex solution. It's going to include more control during drying, more control during shipment, and more control of the storage environment. Now, coffee's complicated, or else we wouldn't have a two-day symposium talking about this. So of course there's no ideal water activity to communicate to a mill and tell me, give me all my coffee at 0.6. 
0.5 or whatever you want. Based on research by Decagon, who's one of the leaders in water activity measurement equipment, we see three main indicators that can guide us toward a range of water activity for specialty coffee. Based on toxin growth, we want our coffee to be below 0.7. For shelf life, the lower the water activity, the more stable our coffee is. But if you have too low water activity, you're impeding the sugar browning reactions that could happen during roasting. This leads me to a range of water activity for specialty coffee between 0.45 and 0.65. Now, as more people collect and analyze water activity data, one of our goals should be to come up with a better justified range of water activity. 0.45 to 0.65 is better than nothing, but it's certainly not written in stone. Collaborations already happened in the US by adding a water activity standard to the green coffee standards. But there are immediate impacts that can be made on our businesses and on the industry as a whole past agreeing that coffee should be below 0.7 water activity. We're all in this room because we agree that working together, we can do a lot more than working on our own. Now that you understand what water activity is, what the risks are, and what some of the potential uses are, you're tasked with dissemination of this information to everyone in your supply chain. Do you remember when the SCAE and SCAA unified to become the SCA? One of the main advantages was global sharing of information. We in this room could be leaders in proving that the unified organization is better than two organizations on their own. We're all tasked with creating an end-to-end -end solution, working together with importers, exporters, roasters, processors, producers, to create a plan to mitigate toxin growth and get rid of this reduction in quality from great coffee to mediocre coffee. Now, you're some of the brightest minds in coffee. So, meet another great mind, grab a cup of coffee, and as previous symposium speaker Al Keating from Coffee Supreme said, be generous with your good ideas. Thank you.